back again. Let's see, since our last lecture, I've spent two months vacationing in the Mediterranean, so I am recharged and ready to go after the next subject, which is a good thing because we are throwing all caution to the wind right now and are going to deal with hundreds of thousands of neurons now. We have now graduated from one neuron to two to networks, all of that. We are now going to look at large areas of the brain in our ever-expanding goal to understand where does our behavior come from. And we're going to be looking at a very special area of the brain, not not the part of the brain that makes your heart beat now and then, not the part of your brain that controls your spleen, but the parts of your brain that are involved in emotion. A part of the brain called the limbic system. And the limbic system, not surprisingly, is going to be central to the rest of this course. Now, to begin to appreciate this limbic system, we have to return to a point from an earlier lecture. Your brain is not one homogeneous mass of undifferentiated neurons. Instead, there's a structure to it, an organization, an anatomy, a neuroanatomy. And one important structural feature of the brain is shown here in this first diagram. What we have are clusters, areas, where there's whole bunches of cell bodies grouped together, and what they all do is send their axons projecting to another area with a cluster of cell bodies, which in turn send their axons elsewhere. What we have here is a dichotomy between what are called nuclei within the brain, the clusters of the cell bodies, and then cables, projections, areas where you send your axons onto the next bunch of cell bodies. Another term for this having to do with the color of this, all of the cell bodies grouped together are termed gray matter, and all of those cables white matter, why white, turns out those myelin sheaths wrapped around the axons are a little bit fatty, they're white, that gives this characteristic white color. So we've got gray matter and white matter, we have centers, clusters, nuclei of cell bodies sending projections, sending white matters, sending cables made up of axons talking to the next part of the brain. Now, given this organization, what we could now do in the next diagram is take a look at the broad features of the brain. Not a bunch of neurons forming a network, but the neurons that make up entire regions, and we are talking about millions, tens of millions of neurons. And in a very, very simplistic way, as we approach here what the mammalian brain is about, we see some basic building blocks that are in every mammal's brain and spinal cord. And what do we got? We got the brain sitting there, on top of it, heading down the spine, is the spinal cord. Starting at that end, what you have is an organization built around projections, axons, going to the spinal cord. What do they carry? Sensory information. Information about touch, about pain, about temperature. And coming from the spinal cord, projections, axons heading out to the body, telling your muscles to contract, telling your body to have all sorts of things. So projections to and from the spine. Then, moving upward, you've got the back part of the brain, the brain stem, the hind brain. For our purposes, not very exciting part of the brain. It makes you to remember to breathe now and then. It makes your heart beat on its own. That sort of stuff, not very central to understanding emotion until we get back to this later, but brain stem, hind brain. Then, sitting on top of that is the limbic system. And for our purposes right now, the limbic system equals emotional regulation. And what we will see is how laughably simplistic that is. Nonetheless, that works for the moment. And then sitting on top of the limbic system, we've got the cortex. The cortex that does all of the abstract cognitive sort of stuff. And for our purposes right now, just as the limbic system is this frothy emotional part of the brain just marinating in excess and impulsivity, the cortex is this gleaming stainless steel computer up there. And we will see how incorrect that is as well. Okay, so we've got this broad organization going on here, and we're going to have a lot of focus here on the limbic system. Now, interestingly, right off the bat, the limbic system and the cortex sitting on top of it are very different depending on what species you are looking at. You look at a human, you look at a lab rat, you look at a lizard, and the hindbrain and the brainstem and the spinal cords are surprisingly similar. You look at a limbic system and suddenly you are in the realm of a mammalian specialty. Lizards are not famous for their emotional lives. It's not until you get into mammals that you're getting complex emotions. 
and emotions that have complex physiology underlying it. By the time you get to the cortex, you are dealing with a part of the brain that is very much a primate specialization. It's not until us and our primate cousins that you have this much of the brain devoted to cortex. That's why primates are doing fancy stuff that all sorts of other species can't. Just as one measure of it, there's more than 150 different species of primates out there, and you look at how big the cortex is in any given species, how big it is relative to the rest of the brain, and what you see is the best predictor. The more individuals in the social group of that species, the bigger the cortex. What is the cortex about in primates? It's about social intelligence. It's about keeping track of who's doing what to whom and small town gossip and all that thing. That's a first hint that there is no way the cortex and its abstract function is going to be separate from the limbic system and emotion. We will see this in much more detail. Okay, so the limbic system. The limbic system started off life early in the last century with a very different name. And it was originally called the Rhine encephalon. Rhine, nose, R-H, Rhine encephalon, the nose brain. What's that about? Why was it the nose brain? Because the first species it was studied in was the laboratory rat. And what you see immediately is a very distinctive feature of wiring of the sensory systems. And what we see here is a limbic system in this diagram, carefully drawn to be just a black box. And what we see on top are the projections, how you get from the ear, from hearing, to the limbic system, how you get from the eyes, how you get from any sensory system. And we already know something about it. We do our whole Hubel and Wiesel number, a projection into the first layer of the cortex and the second and the third, and a whole bunch of synapses later, you get some neuron that remembers to send its axons down to the limbic system and tell you something about what you're seeing, what you're hearing, all of that. That's a general property of the sensory systems until you get to olfaction. And the thing about olfaction is you start with those neurons that are the olfactory receptors and you are one synapse away from the limbic system. Before your cortex knows anything about what you're smelling, the emotional part of your brain does. And suddenly we've got this whole world of smell and strong emotions that are not even conscious yet of smell and memory. Memory hippocampus, as we will see hippocampus is in the limbic system, suddenly you've got that phenomenon where some smell wafts in the room and suddenly you're back in kindergarten and you remember the little pastel colored chairs and the, the taste of the LePage glue and suddenly all of that is evoked. Smell is highly evocative of emotion, of memory. We got the Ryan encephalon. We've got the nose brain. And it was only as scientists became more sophisticated and understood the behavior of rodents that they realized you can't talk about a rat's emotions without talking about what it's smelling in the world. A transition in the 1930s recognizing this Ryan encephalon of the rat is the emotional center for all sorts of species out there and thus the term the limbic system. Now what we'll see is the limbic system is made up of a whole bunch of different sub-areas and you've already known one of them. One is the hippocampus, but we will see a lot more of these in detail. And in this diagram, we're not yet naming these structures, but all we see is there's a bunch of different parts of the limbic system and they all have a very similar wiring scheme. They send projections to each other, they talk to the cortex, they talk to various parts of the brain, but the main thing they all do is send projections down to this critical funnel in the brain, an area that we are going to hear about over and over and over, the hypothalamus. Everybody in the limbic system wants to influence what the hypothalamus does. Now why is that? Why is that is going to be the next two or three lectures because the hypothalamus plays this pivotal role in how your brain winds up influencing behavior. Just to give away some dramatic foreshadowing here, your hypothalamus runs all sorts of autonomic, automatic things in your body. You get goose flesh in the right setting and it's because your hypothalamus has sent some message down the spine. As we'll see in two entire lectures, the hypothalamus controls all sorts of hormones you release. The hypothalamus plays this central role, so the selfish, narcissistic thing that every part of the limbic system, limbic system wants to do is disproportionately influence the hypothalamus. 
And naturally, the other thing they want to do is to keep the other limbic areas from influencing the hypothalamus, all of them jockeying. And you know the wiring already, which is going to be a whole bunch of excitatory projections into the hypothalamus and a whole bunch of lateral inhibitory ones trying to turn each other off. So a sense now of what all of these guys want to do in the limbic system. So how do you figure out who's doing what? No surprise, most of these limbic structures have a whole bunch of different ways of sending their projections into the hypothalamus, of inhibiting each other. And the way to begin to make sense of it is to use a trick we've already done in here. Okay, how many synapses away from the limbic system is your nose? How many synapses away is your ear, your eyes? counting synapses. As a general rule, the fewer synapses it takes to get from structure A to structure B, the more powerfully influential A is going to be over B. And what you see are all sorts of different routes to get one part from one part of the limbic system to another, how many synapses away. In a very rough approximation, that gives you a good sense of who's influencing who. Okay. All of this sets us up now for actually seeing the components of the limbic system. And I'm going to put up a diagram right now. And before I do so, every single person watching this has to promise to shut their eyes and not look at it. Do not memorize a single thing on this chart. What this shows are some of the main structures of the limbic system. And do not panic. Do not pay any attention. All of these areas will make a great deal of sense if you were schooled in Latin. We've already heard about the hippocampus looking like a seahorse. Another area, the amygdala, looks like a walnut or an almond or something. Rather, I should have learned if I had gotten a decent classical education. All of these horrible multisyllabic Latin names. And even worse, so horrible I haven't even dared to write them down. All of these multisyllabic names for the connections between them, you already know the logic of this, which is lots of these areas have some role in regulating emotion, in regulating how your body responds to emotion, all of that, all of them sending projections to each other, all of them sending projections down into the hypothalamus. So areas of the limbic system, I will recite them now and do not pay attention to these names because the ones that are important we're going to hear about over and over again throughout the rest of this course. You've got areas like the amygdala the hippocampus, the septum, the cingulate, the hypothalamus, mammillary bodies, thalamic parts of the nuclei, nuclei found in the thalamus. Very interestingly, by definition, the limbic system used to be a subcortical part of the brain. The part of the brain that is below the surface, below the cortex, this is all this old, primitive, mammalian emotion and hate and lust and petulance and all that stuff, this is obviously going to be a part of the brain that's completely separate from the cortex sitting up there doing calculus for you. What people have come to realize is there's one part of the cortex which by all logic anatomically should be considered part of the limbic system. And we've already heard about this area. This is the frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex is intimately involved in the limbic system in terms of impulsivity, gratification, postponement. We will hear lots about the frontal cortex. And there was this wondrous accomplished neuroanatomist, a man named Vali Nauda, a Dutch neuroanatomist, who was pretty much the best neuroanatomist of the last century. And in the 50s, he convinced everybody he had just shot his career down the tubes by insisting the frontal cortex is part of the limbic system. This is a world where neuroanatomists could destroy their careers by saying this part of the brain is part of the limbic system. They have these concerns. And he said, when you look at its wiring, and this was even before people knew a lot about its function, when you look at its wiring, this is part of the limbic system. And since then, it has become clear that the cortex is not separated from emotion, and instead it is vastly intertwined. There's a wonderful book from a wondrous neurologist named Antonio Damasio, a book called Descartes' Error, a very, very influential book in the field. Descartes' view that there's this dramatic dichotomy between emotion and cognition. They are utterly disconnected. And what we have learned ever since then with modern neuroscience is they are completely intertwined. We will see endless functional examples of this where pure abstract cognition is deeply influenced, often altered, distorted, often assisted by emotion, and we will see ways in which your emotion is highly influenced by abstract things like 
memory, like thought, and Descartes' error being that there is not a clean dichotomy between the cortical world of cognition and the limbic world of emotion. The frontal cortex is right where that's happening. Very dramatic number of projections between the frontal cortex and the rest of the limbic system. Now, going back to this diagram that you're not supposed to be paying any attention to, what we have here in straight lines and dotted lines are just the connections amongst these areas. Amygdala, hippocampus, hypothalamus, mammillary bodies, thalamus, septum, frontal cortex, all these areas you can reel off, and all of them are connected to each other. And when you look closely, you will see, as promised, some of the connections are very straightforward, and some of them are indirect and loop all over the place and have places where they bypass and other places where they stop along the way. This is part of this extremely complex circuitry. And once again, all built around this broad strategy of bossing around the hypothalamus and trying to keep other limbic areas from doing so. So that sets us up now for beginning to look at what do these different sub-areas of the limbic system do. We already have a sense of the hippocampus. Hippocampus, learning and memory. We heard one sentence before, a couple of lectures back, about the amygdala. Something with fear. What do these different areas do? Embedded in that is the question, how do you figure out what these areas do? How do you figure out what any part of the nervous system does? Even a simple area like one little bit of cortex that controls the movement of this finger and the area of cortex next to it that controls the movement of this finger. How do you figure out the function of a part of the brain that instead does nostalgia for you? or poignance, or love, or any such thing. How do you figure out the function of parts of the nervous system? And here's where we get into the realm of different experimental approaches. How to figure out, you've got area X in the brain, and you're trying to figure out what it does. What are some of the strategies? One version is, experimentally, to go in and damage that part of the brain. Do that in a laboratory animal. Go in, cut a certain pathway, cut a whole bunch of axons connecting A to B, or go in and the term given lesion, damage a cluster, a nucleus, an area of cell bodies, and then basically ask, what works differently now? What doesn't work anymore? You've just gotten some insight into what A does, or by cutting the connection between A and B, what this communication is about between them. That's a classic approach. And that classic experimental approach has been vastly depressingly aided over the years by our endless capacity as humans to generate great study subjects for this sort of thing, soldiers coming back from wars with what are termed projectile wounds, some part of the brain has been blown away, and starting in the 19th century, neurobiologists got enormous amounts of information by studying people who have had parts of their brain lesioned by our political processes and wars in this planet, and what you get there is a whole lot of insight coming from that realm as well. So you destroy a part of the brain, what doesn't work right anymore. Another strategy is you can go in with an electrode and you stimulate a certain part of the brain. You artificially, electrically excite that part of the brain. You make those neurons have action potentials and you see what happens next. And it was indeed these sorts of classical studies where you would stimulate a part of the brain and, as mentioned before, an area of the cortex and an animal a primate, and suddenly it uncontrollably moves this finger. And move the stimulated electrode over a little bit, and you move the next finger, you are mapping out function that way. Other versions. Now you stick in a different type of electrode. This is not one which stimulates the neuron. It instead records. It tells you when that neuron is getting excited. That was the Hubel and Wiesel approach. Sticking, recording electrodes into the neurons in the first layer of the visual cortex. Aha! This one gets excited if and only if this one single photoreceptor in the eye is being stimulated. You are getting, in a sense, a readout what things in the outside world excite this neuron. Those used to be the classical approaches, lesioning, damage to the nervous system, stimulate it, record from it. In recent years, a whole new area has become possible, and this is taking advantage of this whole revolution in neuroradiology using these imaging machines. CAT scanners, PET scans, MRIs, functional MRIs, where basically you can look at activity in the part of the brain while you're doing something. 
and you can show things like play a certain sound to somebody in a functional scanner and up lights the auditory cortex, things like that, give somebody a problem to think about and you can see what pathways in the brain light up. So that's another approach that's been extremely powerful. Finally, the classical approach, the most straightforward one, is to do boring old neuroanatomy. If A sends a projection to B, and A sends a projection to all of these places, and in turn, A gets inputs from these places, if you know what a whole bunch of them do, you could begin to figure out what the function is of A. These are some of the classic approaches to figure out what does this part of the brain do. And with these classic approaches come a whole bunch of pitfalls. The first one being, you can go damage a certain part of the brain and nothing changes at all. Does that mean this part of the brain has no function? Obviously not. It means some other area may have taken over this function. There's the capacity for compensation. That's been immensely sort of challenging. And the capacity for that compensation is so strong in the cortex that there was this famous neurobiologist, Carl Lashley, who about a half century ago was looking for where are individual memories stored in the cortex and as we know already they're not stored in individual places they're stored in networks and networks that could compensate for damage and he came up with this famously depressed paper towards the end of his career where he basically concluded at the end there's no place in the brain where memories are stored because he was dealing with the old notion that this particular part of the cortex would have a certain type of memory and would see in an animal trained with certain memory tasks it would have no effect at all you lesion an area and some other place could take over so that makes things extremely difficult another major problem is you damage a certain part of the brain and a function is stopped as a result and now you've figured out what that part of the brain does some of the time, you have not gotten useful information because what you have damaged is not a nucleus, an area of a whole bunch of neuronal cell bodies, but you've instead damaged a cable, a passageway. And that's like saying you're trying to understand how much of some bread is being delivered to some city and you go and you lesion the main highway into that city and no bread comes in anymore and what do you conclude about that spot on the highway that you've lesioned you say ah that's obviously where bread is made because when we destroy that part of the highway no more bread gets delivered no you have not destroyed the bread making center you've destroyed what is termed a fiber of passage so another way in which you get into trouble is by not recognizing when you are dealing with a nucleus, an area of neuronal cell bodies, and when you were dealing with a cable, just some highway running through there. Okay, so these are the sort of things that make any neurobiologist crazy. All of these issues are that much more awful when now instead of trying to figure out what part of the brain makes your finger do this, you are now trying to figure out complex, subtle, interactive emotions. And when you get to the limbic system, these challenges become far more challenging. For example, you are trying to figure out what part of the limbic system is involved in sexual behavior. What's the sort of clues you have to get? You better know a lot about the species that you're studying because different species have different sensory systems that are relevant to sexual behavior. We've already heard about rodents paying a whole lot of attention to olfaction, our rhinencephalon, our Wellesley effect from oh so many lectures ago. Meanwhile, if you're studying an electric fish, electric fish get ex sexually excited by electricity, by the right electrical call from a number of other individuals in their species. They communicate electrically. Some other species communicates with visual cues. What that's going to tell you is you better know what species and what behavior you're dealing with because in one species you would expect to see olfactory projections coming in and another you should expect to see heavy auditory ones things like that figuring out something you better know what sort of species you're dealing with in terms of behavior another example of that you've got some part of the limbic system and you were studying a lab rat and you stimulate that part of the limbic system and this rat quickly runs over to the corner where there's a pile of papers newspapers or whatever and she shreds up the newspapers and stuffs them all in the corner Whew, okay, what's that about? Some sort of behavior. And then you study the same part of the brain in a rhesus monkey. And you stimulate that area. And what does this rhesus monkey do? She runs over to the other side of the cage and takes a water bottle and holds it like this and rocks it back and forth. What are you looking at? You are looking at a part of the brain relevant to maternal behavior.
And you better know that rats go about being maternal by building nests out of shredded up things, and primates go about maternal behavior by cuddling their child in a position where it could nurse, and you need to know what species you're looking at. Next version of needing to know what you're dealing with. Now we've got a part of the brain, a part of the limbic system, which for our purposes right here simplistically has something to do with aggression. So you take some male baboon and you stimulate that part of the brain and he suddenly displays his canines and he gets this whole aggressive position and he looks like it's about to be bad news. Okay, you've just learned this part of the brain has something to do with aggressive displays. Being a good scientist, you want to replicate this. So you check this out in the next baboon and you stimulate that part of the brain and nothing happens. The guy just sits there. Uh-oh, there goes your doctoral thesis. What's happening here? One guy, you get this flora dominance display. In the next guy, nothing happens. What's going on? Eventually, you figure it out. The second guy is socially subordinate. The second guy is sure feeling those aggressive emotions, but he has been trained by experience. You don't go making those threatening gestures because you're going to get your head handed back to you. Suddenly, not only do you need to know about the species, you need to know about the individual member of that species. So trying to figure out what the limbic system does is very, very challenging. Now given all of those endless caveats, here we will have a very superficial, mindlessly so, four minute overview of what some of these limbic areas do, and we will be returning to a whole bunch of them in far more detail. Amygdala. Amygdala we already know about. Amygdala is fear. Amygdala is trauma of tremendously insightful importance. The amygdala also plays a key role in aggression. And that will dominate some of our final lectures. Just one thought there to file away in preparation for it. A part of the brain that is central to aggression is a part of the brain that responds to fear. In lots of ways, you cannot make sense of aggressive behavior outside of that aggressive organism fearing feeling fearful. Another part of the limbic system, the septum, has a very opposite role. It tends to inhibit aggressive behavior. Aha, back to that theme, different limbic structures inhibiting each other. Metaphorically, one is putting your foot on the gas, the other on the brake, areas working in opposition. Hippocampus, we know the hippocampus ad nauseum already. The hippocampus, learning and memory, but only certain types of learning and memory, ones that are called explicit conscious facts that you are aware of. I am a mammal, I have a dentist appointment next Tuesday, things that you know, and you know that you know. When things are automatic, how to do a backhand in tennis, doing the trill on the piano piece, things like that that you don't have to think about, that in a sense your hands, your body knows before you do, that's a different part of the nervous system. The hippocampus learning and memory, but this conscious, explicit sort of memory. Moving on, in the simplistic overview, mammillary bodies, mammillary bodies have something to do with maternal behavior. We've heard about that before, and what we're going to see are different areas in the limbic system, very different in their responsiveness to different hormones. Moving on, the frontal cortex, we already know is going to do interesting stuff. The frontal cortex keeps you from doing socially inappropriate things. And in a very, very mindless way, what you can think of is the frontal cortex trying to wrestle the limbic system into submission and good manners, and often not very successfully. We will return to that in vast detail when considering the neurobiology of aggression. Finally, the hypothalamus, rare at the center of all these influences, the hypothalamus is made up of a dozen different substructures with all sorts of different roles. There's one area, the medial preoptic area, do not remember that term. The medial preoptic area has something to do with sexual behavior. There's two hypothalamic nuclei, the lateral hypothalamus, the ventral medial hypothalamus that have something to do with appetite. One mediates hunger, the other mediates satiation a part of the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and that's involved in daily rhythms, circadian rhythms, things of that sort. What we have is this very crude first pass. And you already know, number one, it's not going to be one function to one structure. You already know ad nauseum by now, number two, the strengths of these connections can change over time. And now when you think about LTP happening in limbic areas, you are now getting pathways of emotion that are more readily occurring than others. You learn to 
love something, you learn to fear something, you learn to respond emotionally, tremendous plasticity in here. Just as your brain can learn a new fact, your brain can learn a new reality about emotions. And finally, it should be no problem at all to begin to recognize, insofar as we all have different neurons and different synaptic patterns of communication and different networks, etc., by the time we get into the limbic system and those individual differences, we are beginning to imagine a part of the brain relevant to why we differ and how we love and how we hate and how we feel despair and how we feel all of those things. What this sets us up now for is the obvious next step. Now we've gotten to how large chunks of the brain influence the hypothalamus. What does the hypothalamus now do?